This is the video lecture on accounting for income taxes. Now whenever we talk about accounting and income taxes in the same context, we have to talk about two different groups. On the accounting side, of course, you have GAAP. You have the generally accepted accounting principles. But on the tax side of things, you have the Internal Revenue Service. And these are two different organizations with two different goals in mind. Now the GAAP principles, which are of course developed by the FASB, they're designed to regulate the profession of accounting, whereas the IRS rules are designed to facilitate the collection of income taxes. So since there are two different sets of rules and two different goals, as you can imagine, they are not necessarily always in agreement in terms of what would be taxable and what would be deductible. So that's what we're talking about whenever we talk about accounting for income taxes. We're talking about accounting for those differences and making up for that gap between the, the goals and the ideas of these two different sets of rules. Now in terms of gap terminology, we're going to have something called pre-tax financial income. That's the terminology that we use in accounting. And that's the amount of income that our taxes are going to be based on. And then we're going to have our tax expense. And that's the amount of taxes that we feel, according to accounting, should be paid. Whereas, in terms of IRS terminology, it's a little bit different. IRS terminology uses taxable income as the term for the income that's taxable, and taxes payable to refer to the amount of tax that's actually sent. So it's different terminology based on different sets of rules. Now, some of the differences between GAAP and the IRS are going to be what we call temporary differences. And these differences are only going to be temporarily out of balance. Over time, these are going to be resolved. But for these temporary differences, we are going to do some calculations and we are going to potentially do some journal entries. And when you look at the temporary differences, the common things that you're looking for are really two different areas. First of all, you're looking for revenue that according to GAAP accounting is considered taxable, but the IRS doesn't necessarily consider it taxable until the money has been received. And then the other area that you're looking at are expenses that according to GAAP accounting are deductible, but according to the IRS, they're not deductible until they've actually been paid. So those are some of the differences, the key common temporary differences between GAAP versus the IRS. Now anytime we have a temporary difference, there's going to be three main things that we're going to have to do. And it's important to identify these before we actually take a look at an example. So anytime we have a temporary difference, the first thing we're going to have to do is calculate income but we're going to have two different versions of income. We're going to calculate pre-tax financial income according to GAAP and taxable income according to the IRS and those are two different things. Then we're going to calculate on the second part the amount of tax but again we're going to have two versions. We're going to have tax expense according to GAAP and we're going to have taxes payable according to the IRS. And then third and, and finally, we will then have to complete any necessary journal entries. So to see an example, we have a business here that has $150,000 in net income. 50000 of that is accounts receivable. They also had a $40,000 worth of expenses and they also are in a 30% tax bracket. So based on that information, we're going to have to calculate the income under both versions, the tax under both, and also the journal entry. Now the big thing that we're concerned about is really the accounts receivable. That's really the key thing here that's going to cause there to be a problem. Because think about it. In GAAP accounting, we consider accounts receivable to be revenue. But according to the IRS, since we have not received the money yet, they don't consider that to be taxable. 
So that's going to be the real culprit here. That's going to be the one thing that's going to cause this to not match up. So the first thing I have to do is calculate income. But like I said, I'm going to have two different types. I'm going to have pre-tax income, which is according to GAAP. I'm going to have taxable income, which is according to the IRS. Now look at the very first item, 150000 versus 100000 Why is that different? Because according to GAAP, we consider the entire 150000 to be income. But according to the IRS, the 50000 of that that represents accounts receivable, they don't consider that to be income because we haven't collected the money yet. So that accounts for the difference there. That's why you see two different amounts there. Now, the expenses of 40000 that's the same. We don't have to worry about that, at least not on this example. So 150 minus 40 means that according to GAAP, my pre-tax income is 110000 100 minus 40, that's 60. So that means according to the IRS, my taxable income is 60000 so that gives you two different versions of income. So now that I have that, I can then take those answers and move on to the second step, which is to calculate the actual taxes themselves. Now in this case, <clears throat> we know the business is in a 30% tax bracket. So all I have to do is take my answer from part one. I had 110,000 according to GAAP, 60,000 according to the IRS, Either way, it's based on 30%. So according to GAAP accounting, I get a tax expense of 33000 but I get, according to the IRS, taxes payable of 18000 So again, two different versions of the taxes. Then I'm ready to do the final step, which is to actually record the journal entry. Now what I would say about the journal entry is this. Every time you do this journal entry, for sure, you're going to debit income tax expense. You know that for sure every single time. Also, every single time, you're going to credit income taxes payable. The problem is the amounts are not necessarily going to match up. So back up to part two for a second. Look at the amounts. Tax expense, 33000 Taxes payable, eighteen. See how they don't match. So when I debit income tax expense, that's 33000 When I credit income taxes payable, that's 18000 They don't match. So I need another credit. I need a credit for 15000 And what is that going to be? That's going to be called a deferred tax liability. Why is it called that? Because right now, I'm paying only 18000 when I really know that I should be paying 33, but because I have not collected those receivables, that means eventually I am going to have to pay that tax. So that is a liability, but it is deferred. It's a deferred tax liability. So sometimes you have that occur. When it does, it's always a credit. Of course, it's also possible in some instances to have a deferred tax asset. And if that's the case, it would be over here on the debit side. But we'll see that in, in the demo problem that we do in the next video. Now, in addition to the temporary differences, there are also sometimes permanent differences. And these are differences between GAAP and the IRS that are never going to be resolved. So as a result, we, we don't actually do any calculations or journal entries because they're always going to be different. They're never going to be resolved. So common examples there, first of all, fines and penalties. Any fines and penalties that we pay by the business, they're never going to be deductible because IRS doesn't consider them to be deductible expenses. So that is just a difference there that will always be there. We'll never be able to resolve that difference. And then you have things like certain types of revenue, such as municipal bond revenue, which comes from the interest on the municipal bonds, that's tax exempt according to the IRS, but we still record it as revenue. So little things like that, and there are many different ones. Those are just two of the most common. But things like that, those differences are permanent. They will always be there and they will never be resolved. 
So as a result, we're not going to record any journal entries for those. Now the last thing we're going to talk about in this lecture are our operating losses. Now of course, in any business, there's always the potential. We might make money, we might lose money. Now if we make money, then we're going to have to pay taxes. We're going to have to pay taxes based on our profit. But what if we lose money? Well, if in a business, the IRS allows us to use those losses to offset taxes that have been paid. And we call that an, a net operating loss or NOL. Now the rule is that all of our losses, we can carry them back. We can also carry forward. If we carry back, we're allowed to go back potentially up to two years in the past. And then if we carry any losses forward, we can potentially go 20 years forward into the future. But the carry back must be applied first before any carry forward. So to see an example, we have a business here that had a net income of $100,000 in 2009. They had an income of 200000 in 2010. But then, all of a sudden in 2011, they lost money. They lost $500,000. Then in 2012, they returned to profitable operations and made 50000 They also happened to be in a 30% tax bracket. So what we're going to do there is that year of 2011, we lost all that money, 500000 We can do a carry back we can carry that back potentially two years and then anything that's left over could be carried forward into the future. And think about it, we could carry it back to 2010 and offset that income, then carry it back to 2009 and all this is based on 30 percent. So what we will do is we will first carry it all the way back to 2009. That year we made 100,000 we're in a 30% bracket, so that means that year we paid 30000 in taxes. Well, now that we're carrying that back, we are entitled to a $30,000 refund. And since we lost 500000 we only carried back a hundred. we have more that we can carry back. So now we'll carry it back to 2010. Now that year, we made 200000 so 30%, that's 60000 So now we're going to get a refund of the $60,000 that we made in that year. So between these two years, we're going to get $90,000 back in the form of refunds. And think about it. 100 and 200 is only 300 We lost 500 So that means we still have another 200000 of loss that can be potentially carried forward into the future. And we're going to do that exactly the next year. The very next year we made 50,000. So again, we paid or we should have paid 15,000, but we'll carry that forward. We won't have to pay that 15,000. And we still have 150,000 left to carry forward for the next 19 years into the future.